The photographic art that I was creating actually had the ability to make a difference in someone's life. The mum reached out to me via email and she had been following the other work that I've been doing and she explained to me that her child, Talia, had a condition where she can't walk and she can't hold herself up, she's wheelchair bound, she can't speak. And the mum, as a photographer, had taken beautiful portraits of her, but all of those portraits Talia was either in a chair or lying on her back and Jackie wanted to know if I could create something that freed her from these limitations and when she shared that with me I was like yes yes I think I can. I started working on creating this scene that would then have Talia flying through the air held up by butterflies and we realized that it's something that for parents it gives them this opportunity to see their kid not sick they can look at this and not think of what they're going through, but they can think of that joy that that child has. It's as important for the parents as it is for the kids. Today's creator is Karen Alsop, an Australian photographer and Photoshop artist who has gained international recognition for her unique approach to compositing and image manipulation. Karen is also a sought-after educator. She is the founder of Story Art Education, an online learning platform that provides in-depth training in photography, Photoshop, and compositing techniques. One of Karen's most noteworthy projects is Christmas Wish. Through this program, Karen and her team use their photography and Photoshop skills to create magical holiday portraits for hundreds of ill children worldwide who will unfortunately not be home for the holidays. For some of these families, this is their child's first professional photo. For others, it may be their last. In this episode, we'll dive deep into Karen's creative process, learn more about the inspiration behind Christmas Wish, and hear firsthand about her journey to becoming a world-renowned Photoshop artist and photographer. Thank you so much for joining me, Karen. I'm really excited to have you. How are you doing? Really good, Jesus. So good to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me. For the people that may not know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Start from the beginning. Let us know where you're from, where you grew up, and how did you get into the creative industry? Sure. Well, some of you might be able to already tell that I am Australian from my accent. Uh, I am based <laughs> in Melbourne in Australia and I grew up here. Uh, I grew up as, uh, as someone that wanted to be a teacher, but I also got into photography really, really early. My grandfather was a big inspiration and by the time I was about 14, 15, I had my own cameras. He set me up with a dark room and, you know, I was creating and, and developing in black and white and I, and I was dodging and burning in, in the dark room. And so of wait, course, you, wait, 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 I got, I got to ask you something. You're actually dodging and burning. These are not the tools in Photoshop. These are actual like tangible yeah. things you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like blocking light and revealing light wow. and yeah, doing it in the dark room, which is a whole lot harder than doing it in Photoshop, I must say. Um, but yeah, I, I loved that. And um, as I went into university, I decided that I wanted to kind of take two paths simultaneously. And I um, studied education and became a primary school teacher and secondary school teacher teaching music. And I started my business at the same time, which at that point uh, was graphic design predominantly. And then that sort of morphed into more photography. I realized I enjoyed the photography side more than dealing with graphic design clients and all the back and forth that comes with that. So yeah, I just continued to develop my craft. But all through that time, as I dropped the teaching eventually and went full time, I really was just doing what everyone else was doing. I was a portrait and wedding photographer, basically. Wow. Uh, you know, I dabbled in a bit of Photoshop and I had a few creative ideas along the way, but I never really took it very far. And um, yeah, I loved what I did, but I found that when we had kids, so I, I, I got married early on as well, and um, we waited for a while to have kids. And, you know, and the kids came along in 2011 and 2013, weddings were just no longer working out, especially with my husband Stuart shooting with me. It was just so hard. So I decided to start delving into new ideas and seeing what, what can I do in my career that is family friendly and that is something that I can enjoy and move forward with. And from there, I started trying new things and I started using Photoshop a whole lot more and creating stories out of multiple images, you know, and 
that that has led me to where I am now, which is this is all I do. I'm a digital photographic artist. You know, it, all of my work doesn't matter who I'm doing it for. It has to be out there. It has to be imaginative. It has to be something that you can't capture in in one still image. And yeah, and I'm I'm winning awards, and I've been able to travel the world, and um, it's incredible to be able to live wow. this life. Yeah, we've met in uh, I believe Sydney. You and I were both speaking at Adobe Make It uh, several years ago. I forget what Sorry. year that was, and I've known you online for maybe a couple of years prior to that. And I don't recall exactly how I became aware of your work, but I do remember seeing some of your compositing work. So by the time I met you in person, I already knew who you were. And your work always seems very, very magical. Oftentimes it includes children and them doing amazing things. One of the things that you do that I have helped you with a tiny, tiny little bit, like 0.001% is with the Christmas Wish project, the story art project. And I've been helping you for about maybe four years now, I believe. But I really don't know the history behind that. And it's a project that I'm always very excited to work with every year. You wouldn't believe how much time I spend on some of these projects. I spend more time on some of these projects than my paid work, just because I, I just feel that I need to create something special for these kids. So can you please explain what it is and how you got started with it? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, we appreciate your input so much. Uh, what you did for Grace last year and, and all of the other children is just incredible. So, yeah, Christmas Wish actually began uh, around 2016. And at that point in time, uh, I had realized that the photographic art that I was creating actually had the ability to make a difference in someone's life. Um, I'd previously done a couple of projects for some families directly um, and the first family that I did something for it was because of them that this all started um, mm. the mum reached out to me via email and she had been following the other work that I've been doing and she explained to me that her child Talia had um, she had a condition where she can't walk and she can't hold herself up she's wheelchair bound she can't speak and the mum, as a photographer, had taken beautiful portraits of her. But all of those portraits, Talia was either in a chair or lying on her back. And Jackie wanted to know if I could create something that freed her from these limitations. And when she oh, shared wow. that with me, I was like, yes, yes, I think I can. Um, and, and from there, I, I talked to the family, found out what does Talia like? You know, even though she can't talk, she can smile and laugh. And um, the family was able to share with me the things that brought her joy. And a lot of that was animals and butterflies and her dog. And so I started working on creating this scene that would then have Talia flying through the air, held up by butterflies. And we put that together and, you know, Talia came to the studio and I photographed lots of different photos of her so that with her family holding her up in different positions and got the amazing smile and then was able to composite that together and put all of those different pieces together to free her from everything that was holding her back. And that was the start. That was the start of the Heart Project. And then that led to Christmas Wish later that year, which we decided, well, you know, as a team, there's a few people involved that thought, well, we can go in and we can make a difference in more kids' lives at once that are stuck in hospital during that Christmas season. And um, yeah, we went into Monash Children's Hospital in Melbourne and we photographed 30 children. And I sat in a back room that afternoon. So we, we brought Santa in and we did it in front of a green screen and I sat in a back room. I'd already created the backgrounds, but I was madly editing each and every one of them myself with the rest of the team kind of printing and processing and, and framing them. And then we delivered them out to those kids in the hospital that evening. So we were there till about 11 p.m. at night. It was a massive day, wow. but it was the start of something. And, you know, from there, it was like... Well, what was their expression when you first oh. showed them these pieces, that very first experience? Yeah. What was that like? Well, that that was super exciting because they had no idea that these were going to be magical Christmas pieces. They really just thought they were posing in front of a green screen. 
<laughs> and yeah, so we we got those responses on video. The first video, I think, got wow. thousands and thousands and thousands of people watching it because they saw that response from the kids and how much it meant. And yeah, they just like they were like, what? But <laughs> then you know, the parents are crying, and it was you. We realized that it's something that for parents it gives them this opportunity to see their kid not sick. And a lot of them have said like like other kids and and that they can they can they can look at this and not think of what they're going through but they can think of that joy that that child mm. has so that it's as important for the parents as it is for the kids right yeah yeah fast forward to christmas 2022 how big is this project because i understand that it's several hundreds if not thousands of people over different countries so where are we at now with this project yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we had, um, we, we've we over the years been able to go to different places with our Santa, but we've also had teams that operate um, under the Christmas wish and they go in as a team and they photograph. So we we do have teams all around the world. I think we had about seven in 2022. Now we are growing it again because there was a, obviously a bit of a, <laughs> something happened in the last few years that stopped travel and going into hospitals. But we still actually operated through the years of COVID and the pandemic. You know, we were still able to, um, in some way, photograph the kids. You know, we had the extra masks on, we had the extra distancing. Um, but we were able to use our skills and the editors that are behind the scenes, you know, there's about 100 of them working on it 24-7 for three weeks straight, just churning out these images, uh, uh, you know, up to about 400, you know, in, in a year. So they are able to take the mask off Santa and, you know, have a, a and as you did, we had another photo of Santa yeah, when the kids yeah. weren't in the room so that yeah. you could comp him and, and put that, his face back on him. <laughs> Sounds weird. Definitely. Know, but yeah. It's, um, so we've been able to use these skills in a way that means that we could continue to give this gift. There's hundreds of people involved. Um, there's lots of support from imaging companies and everything, but it's just continuing to grow. So we're, we're just you know, excited about the future and, and what that's going to bring. I remember my just this last, last one that I did for Grace, I spent close to 20 hours on that photo. I spent so much time. <laughs> and my girlfriend comes into, into my office here and she said, oh my God, are you still working? And I said, yeah. And it was about three in the morning and I've been working on the photo all day. And she said, well, aren't you going to get some sleep? And I said, well, I have to turn this in and I don't have time anymore. I have other commitments and this thing needs to be turned in. And then I said to her, Grace may not have another Christmas. I don't know. So I need to make sure that this one is good because how sad would it be that because I have to get up early tomorrow, I have a meeting or whatever tomorrow, a client project or whatever tomorrow, I can't put an extra hour or two on this if she doesn't have another Christmas. You know, like I need to make sure that this gets done. So like every year I spend a lot of time on these projects and then having gone through a health situation myself made me even more attached to the project because I realized what it's like being in the hospital with people not being able to visit you. So I suffered a stroke in 2021. At that time, I couldn't have any visitors. So the entire time I was in the hospital, I was by myself. So I remember that year, I think you reached out and you asked me if I was going to be okay to work on the project. And I was like, absolutely, I'm still recovering. So yeah. my stroke happened in October. And I think you reached out in November, maybe late November, something along those lines, very soon after. And I said, no, I, I have to work on it. Like, I just have to because I, I, I was just in the hospital by myself for almost a week. I know what these kids are going through. There's no way that I'm not going to be involved in this. So I just want to say thank you for having me be a part of it. It's it's always a pleasure to work on it. And I just wish I had more hours in the day to do more. Yeah, I, I, I think we all do. You know, I actually wish I could be just doing projects for people all the time and not have to make money and not have to live. And I know I hear <laughs> the same thing from Santa as well. So he's been yeah. with us since the beginning and he volunteers wow. all his time. He's just like, yeah, he just wishes he could win the lottery so he could continue to do this, you know, full time. But yeah. A hundred percent. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are some of the, what are the challenges? Let's put it that way. The challenges of, of working with this project. The challenges from my perspective are that, you know, I need to make sure that it's supported and it happens every year. And part of that is something that 
I make sure I do is that I capture the footage behind the scenes or I get people to capture it. I put together a video at the end. I put together media releases and all of that is so time consuming. It really yes. is. And I yes. actually wish I didn't have to do it, but I do it for two reasons. Um, one is because sharing that sharing the project means that we garner more support every year, but it also means that it, it shares the inspiration to other people. And I think that's the biggest reason yes. that I do things like this too, is that it's not it's not just to make myself feel good for doing something, but you know, if I can encourage other people to use a gift that they have, a talent that they have, and to make a difference, you know, at some stage in each year, then then that's pretty important to me. So that's the hard yeah. thing is is all of that other yeah. stuff that goes with it. Yeah. For yeah. sure. And it, it's worth it because this last year, 2022, uh, one of the composites that I work with with Carla and also a composite I did in 2021 with, I'm sorry, Grace was this year, Carla was last year. Um, That's right. I think yeah. I got that right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both of their composites made it to, uh, I'm not exactly sure which newspaper, but newspapers in Australia. And I saw some photos of the actual newspapers and the children must be ecstatic to to see their photo in a newspaper, you know? So all that extra work, not only that you create this amazing service, if you will, where they're going to receive a composite they're going to treasure for the rest of their lives, but then they get a news, they might see themselves in the newspaper. It, it, it must be such a great feeling for them. Yeah, they do. Oh, they love it. Um, you know, the parents are always so keen to be part of it and to share their joy in, you know, receiving the images. Um, yeah, it, it's awesome. Sometimes they're on the news. Sometimes, you know, the news crews come yeah. down and they love that as well. So That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Can we call this charity? Is this charity work that you do? Is that a good label for this? Yeah, I think it's a good label. Um, you know, I haven't set it up as a, an official charity status. It's just something that's a bit too complicated, but it's right. definitely a charity, you know, and it's, um, it's sure. fully volunteer driven and, you know, no one um, gets paid to do it. No one pays money right. to get it. So, yeah. Yeah. What about the other part? Because I'm assuming you have to make money somewhere in order for you to have the time to devote to these kids and, and their portraits. So where does Karen make her money? What is your primary source of income these days? Yeah, well, I've got quite a large different source of income coming from different streams. So, um, you know, I I do commercial work. So I'll um, create composites for commercial clients. I do work for domestic clients. Um, I don't really like calling them domestic clients, but anyway, I haven't come up with a better name, but um, family. What does that mean, domestic yeah, clients? Yeah, I mean, it means like, you know, you might normally do traditional portraits for families or pet, pet photos, so whereas I do something that's really out there for them. I find out what are their interests and, you know, we bring something together that's completely telling their story. Um, so I do a bit of that and then I sell my art. So I've got exhibitions happening and, you know, that's been growing substantially over the last few years and it's been something that's become a much greater focus for me. Um, I think through COVID opportunities actually arose and then that's been something that I'm pushing. Um, and then I teach as well. So, uh, you know, right. I, I teach people um, with masterclasses and my story education site and um, and then presenting yeah. and yeah, all those are all those other things. Yeah, yeah. Two questions I want to ask you, and completely unrelated. But the first one is: uh, let's talk a little bit about the teaching, and then we go back into the. Did you call it fine art photography? Is that what you called it? In the exhibition sense, it's the the work that I sell as art. Yeah, so it's it's personal the work that, work that I create that I sell. Perfect. I, I want to talk about both things. Let's talk about the, the teaching first. I do a lot of teaching myself. And one of the things that I, I read about you is that you actually have a degree in education, Correct. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, which really does come in handy. So yeah, yeah I was... So I'm the, jealous, the, the, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've always loved teaching. And primary and secondary teacher um, with a Bachelor of Education. And I taught in primary and secondary school for eight years. And wow. I taught primarily music, but a, a bit of photography and and drama and things as well. Um, and that certainly is something that I've wanted to carry through and carry on. It's, um, it's a joy that I get imparting to other people and sharing what I've, what I figure out. Yeah. If I come to you as a student, what am I going to learn from Karen? What's your unique selling proposition when it comes to teaching? 
Yeah, well, I think the biggest um, focus for me over the last few years has been the masterclass that I teach. And mm-hmm. and that is something that is really project driven for each of the people that come through it. And for, for me, it's important that they find their niche, that they find mm-hmm. the thing that they enjoy doing. Like I can teach the the specific technical skills that will help them, the, the better workflows, you know, the making sure that they're looking at light and shade and perspective and scale and all of those things. And I can help guide them on that and guide on, um, you know, even making money and, and printing and, and all of that. But they need to find what it is that they're passionate about and go down their own path as well. Yeah. A hundred percent. You said two things that I completely agree with. Number one is project driven. I really think that that's the best way to learn. As you mentioned, you can teach everybody all the you know tools and shortcuts and all that. But at the end of the day, working with projects, I think, is really what really develops your skills as anything, really, not just a photographer, but definitely working on projects. And the second part is passion. I really do think that people do need to find their passion. When people ask me, how do I learn Photoshop? My first question always is, well, what do you want Photoshop for? Is it for editing your family photos? Is it for creating composites? You know, what is the purpose of you using the tool? And then I can help you maybe find some projects that will get you started. That could also be translated into passionate. What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about, again, creating composites or portrait photography? What is your passion? So that's those are two things that I completely, completely agree with. And one of the questions that I was going to ask you earlier was about the work that you exhibit. I didn't know much about that part of, of the work that you do. So can you tell me a little bit about how that works, what that's all about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think over the years, I've created a lot of pieces that are highly saleable that are, um, <laughs> and, and a lot of them- You mean actually... really good. <laughs> well, look, no, I mean that they um, <laughs> connect with people, you know, that they're, sure. they're, um, there's something that people will want to put on their wall. And, you know, um, I've, I've focused in a lot on anthropomorphic work. So making animals human-like, and I love doing that. It is so much fun. And so a lot of my work that I sell is very much animal focused, not all of it, but, but a lot of it. And so developing pieces um, that, that are saleable is it's a joy for me because I'm like, I'm looking at it from two perspectives. I'm looking at it from what do I want to create and, and have fun with, but what are other people going to see? So during lockdown, so we had a lot of lockdowns in Pelpin. Yeah. And um, we had a particular stage where we were allowed out for a bit uh, and it was kind of in between a couple of lockdowns. So my family and I went up to Puffing Billy, which is not far up the road, and we were walking through and there was a building being built, a $20 million visitor centre. Um, and so as we were walking around it, I thought, hey, what if I propose something to them that I create a series that is highly focused around Australian animals and, and Puffing Billy, and that that can be something that we I can exhibit and that they can also merchandise. So they can put on coasters and t-shirts and everything. And so I, I then went back home. I created two pieces. By then we'd been locked down again. So I was really regulated to what I had in my stock collection. And I've got about 40,000 images that I have in Adobe Lightroom uh, that I keep for things. So I was working, I created these two pieces and I proposed this exhibition and licensing um, to them. And I heard back a couple of weeks later from them, they said, yes, we'd love to go ahead. So that actually has spearheaded a whole lot of things. Um, Puffing Billy is a steam train that is a big tourist attraction. They have hundreds of thousands of visitors every year um, coming. So tourists now, uh, again, from overseas. And so I created a piece, a series of eight pieces of these Australian animals doing things like taking photos or sitting on the train, you know, basic, basic compared to some of my other ones in, t- in terms of what was on it, but something that was really highly saleable. And I also had the opportunity to exhibit my other pieces that contain animals. I've got a series called Animal Puns, which I have put as many animal sayings in the piece that I can, and people have to try and find them. So, give me an example of an animal saying, <laughs> like elephant in the room, and that, that's okay. one of the main ones. Or leopard right. can't change its spots. 
or don't okay. count your chickens before they're hatched. So there that are sounds so, really fun. There's, there's so many. So I, I did a, I did, I've done four of those so far. One focused on dogs, one on pigs, one on cows and bulls, and and one on animals. And so those are up, and also a homeless wildlife series. So this series, I actually photograph rescue animals, uh, and I put them into human-like situations. So like people connect to them like they're a child that's homeless, and so they're in they're in this yeah um, situation where you know the wombat's in a bin, um, like a homeless wombat with a newspaper over the top of him, and they really connect with people on a on a deep level. So. Those are all up and they, they went up as a two-month exhibition in this beautiful visitor centre and now it's permanent. So they've loved it so much that I'm now working on a massive piece that's going to be showcased and I need to get it done in the next month, but it, it's coming together. So 50 Australian sayings in wow. one piece. <laughs> that's amazing. Can't wait to yeah. see it. That sounds yeah. incredible. One yeah. of the uh, phrases that you mentioned a few times during your answer was highly sellable. What does that mean to you? Yeah. Uh, look, sometimes you can do work that means something to yourself, but would someone put it on the wall? Mm -hmm. What I've found with the work that I'm doing, it tends to really connect with a really broad range of people. And, and it's people, I've had people come from different places around the world and then they come back to me and they buy a big canvas of, say, one of the animal puns and they take it home in a, in a roll and they, and they put it up on their wall. They're loving it because they can interact with it. They're loving it because they can have a conversation about it. And they're loving it just to be able to look at it as well. Um, you know, the, the animal, uh, the Aussie animal adventures one, well, I mean, that's highly saleable just because it's so tourist friendly. You know, kangaroos, wombats, koalas. So when I'm working on things, I guess, yeah, I, I do need to approach it from that perspective that is this something that other people would want to put on their wall? I guess the follow-up question to that would be, how does one come up with highly sellable ideas? What's your process like? <laughs> I don't really, I, I think it's just a natural investigation and just watching what's happened with previous works. Mm, okay. Um, and then assessing it and going, okay, that, that worked well. Maybe that one didn't work quite so well. Um, you know, see, the, the difference between creating work, putting it up on an online gallery and hoping it sells, or, you know, having, having it in that sort of form, to having it in a place where I can literally sit there and watch the crowd come through. I can see what they're loving. I can see them pointing at it and talking about it and interacting. That's actually been a huge benefit to me because um, you, you're actually seeing that response from people in a physical way. Yeah. The way that you explain that is exactly the same way that I would explain to people how a YouTube video works. When you post up a, a YouTube video, you may feel and think that it's the best thing ever made, but then... It's, it doesn't perform well. Why didn't it perform well? Well, you can watch the analytics and, and learn from how people react to the video and how it performed. And from there, you can come up with a newer version or, or something completely different, but based on that information. So it sounds like that's what you do with the art, that you take the information yeah. of one piece and apply it to the next one. And then you do that so Correct. many times and eventually it's highly sellable. Yeah, yeah. And it's like this one that I'm working on now. I... I totally anticipate that it'll be highly sellable because it's got two things. It's it's centered around Puffing Billy, which is where it's going to be showcased. Um, so the scene is set. It's got the animals in it as as always. But it's got Australian sayings and it's going to have the translations. So knowing it, it's a tourist market um, and that they already love the puns. It's like bringing it all together. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and. Your website is called Story Art, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. To me, that's a wonderful name that perfectly describes who you are as an artist. Because even even with the example you just gave me about the highly sellable piece, it has a story behind it. It's already placed in a scene and it has a target audience. So I think, in my humble opinion, one of the reasons for your success is that at least the stuff that I've seen, 
always has a story behind it. Is Was that a conscious yeah. decision? I mean, I'm assuming it is based on the website name. But early on, early in the beginning, back to when you made that transition from being a wedding photographer to, say, a compositing artist, or maybe back then when you were a wedding photographer, you were also thinking about the story the photo was going to tell. I guess the question is, have you always thought about the story behind the photo? Yeah, I, I, I think I have. You know, even when I was a wedding photographer, we were making what we called wedding video stories. Uh, and mm. and that was a big part of what we were doing really early on when not many people were doing it. So that mix of video and photos put together with music to tell that story of the day. Um, you know, it's it's as I started going into this and looking at what I wanted to create, I was always coming up with stories or in the early days, also a lot of the time using classic stories and bringing that to life through the Photoshop compositing. Um, so photographing the elements and, and yeah, bringing something to life, whether that be Geppetto's workshop with my dad as Geppetto and my son as Pinocchio, you know, or Super my cool. daughter flying on a plane with a dog. Um, so they've been, yeah, just always story driven. Yeah. 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 I definitely think that's the best way to create, the best way to sell, the best way to pretty much do anything as human beings. We're, we're story animals. So it, it I wish I were a better storyteller. I wish I was as good as you. I think that any successful creator creates stories with whatever they create, whether it's music, whether it's photos, it doesn't matter. Story is always the most important thing. I want to change the conversation to something new. As I understand that you are now evolving your skill set and you're now learning about AR. Uh, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, First of all, what is AR? Like, How does that work? How did you get into it? What are you doing with it? Oh, I'm loving it. So augmented reality and integrating that with my work. There's a few reasons I got into it. So I've always wanted to explore it a little bit more. I've always wanted to make my work more highly interactive. So if people come and see the work, they can interact with, like, I picture little um, fun little characters that they might talk to, you know, different things. And it, there was always a barrier to that. There was always a, well, it's going to be really costly to create something like that. But at, towards the end of last year, I came across Hovelay, so a company that I've now since been working with really closely on this, this work that I'm creating. And from the start, from the outset, using Hovelay as the software that I put all the, the elements into to create this augmented reality experience, which I'll explain a little bit more, um, it was really quite easy to do. It sort of made sense from a photographer's point of view and from someone that's done a bit of video. You know, there's the option to do, use green screen, which of course we do a lot of, and use green screen and have holograms. So what I did at the end of last year or so, I thought I've always wanted to bring Santa to the families that he can't get to because he can't be everywhere for Christmas wish. Um, so I filmed Santa in the studio on, against the green screen and I got him to talk to the kids and have a little reindeer there and everything. And we created a whole augmented reality um, space where it didn't matter where the child was in the world, which hospital they're in, they could point a device and they could see Santa in their room. And Santa's wow. literally there talking to them. That was like the early start of it. And um, that has yeah opened the doors for all these other ways that we can use augmented reality. So a lot of what I'm doing now, you see it, there's a picture behind me actually, which I've created in the augmented space where you so hold a device over the image and things come out at you. So I'm working on photographing uh, elements in three dimensional space so that they can turn and they can be part of it. So something that's in my artwork Thing comes out of my artwork in the, in this one it's books wow. and movement and animation and working with after effects to animate elements of my pieces and then that becomes part of the experience which can then be integrated into exhibitions but it can also be books so I'm working on a book project as well where every page has an augmented reality experience you know and soon there'll be glasses Apple glasses, Google glasses, that people will just be walking around and I envision them just walking around and they'll see my artwork and all of a sudden, poof, it comes to That's life. That's incredible. Yeah. So let, talk to me a little bit about how do you create this type of work? Um, you mentioned Adobe After Effects. Are there other applications that you use? How does 
for somebody listening and they might want to dabble in this, what applications do they need to look into? There are so many applications out there. I've been dabbling in some of the 3D applications in Adobe. Um, so a lot of those will help you to create um, to create 3D elements and to also kind of put, I guess, like clothes on them, really, like kind of put different textures on them and things. I have been working in Photoshop. Uh, they are phasing out the 3D yes, in Photoshop, unfortunately. Sadly. But I've been using Photoshop at this point to make my 2D elements puff up <laughs> and make them 3D. Um, mm -hmm. there, are, there are applications you can use to, um, even on a phone, but you can use uh, you know, a camera as well and, and the computer to photograph something on all angles, up on mm -hmm. the top and around, and then it creates that in 3D space. Now, of course, you can use that to print something in 3D, but you can also mm -hmm. use it in the augmented space where it um, can appear in three-dimensional form. So I've been you know, going through all the different things and working out the best ways to do it and the most streamlined ways. And I'm still definitely on a learning journey, but really, really loving it because it just brings new life to every artwork that mm -hmm. I've ever done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's incredible. So you're a mom, you own a business, run a charity, have your training business and are doing pieces for sale. Where do you find the time to do it all? I don't know. I mean, I mean even partnered with uh, another lady, Robin Campbell, we run the Stream Photographic Prize, which certainly takes up most of our year. I just got to slot it in. I've got to have a good Google calendar. I must say, though, it's kind of funny, you know, every, a lot of people that I meet and I share what I do, they're like, oh, you have the best job. That's amazing. It must be so much fun. And then there are my kids who are nine and 11 who are just complaining that, mom, you're just always doing boring. Why do we have to go to Puffing Billy again? Why are you just sitting on the computer doing this? And I said, I keep saying, them, one day they'll appreciate it one day. <laughs> I've never met your children, but if I ever do, I'll tell them, kids, let me tell you what the opposite is. You never leave the house like me. <laughs> I was in the house all the time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I would have loved to go in out once in a while. I often tell people, I love my job. I could describe myself as a content creator, and there's different areas that that falls into. And for me, the most difficult part is finding the time to do everything as I want to do everything. And eventually, at some point, I realize that if I say yes to everything, then I'm saying no to a lot of things. So now I have to be careful with what I say yes to because I don't want to say no to something I might want to do. For example, this podcast, this is something I've been wanting to do for years. The first time I opened up a Google Doc and started plotting it out, I looked at the date. It was January, I think, January or February of 2013. So 10 wow. years. And I I had a list of guests back in those days. A lot of those guests are not even online anymore. And some of those guests I could still probably invite. And funny enough, some of those guests are now my friends that I didn't know at the time. But the point is, is that I was always so busy. At the time, I had a full-time job. I was starting the YouTube channel. I was doing side work. I was doing all kinds of things, much like I am now, but now I'm much more organized. I have a couple team members that help me out with different things. I say I with the video editing, Pauline, with copywriting, social media, and things like that. So one of the ways that I manage to do more is by having people take care of certain things. Do yeah. you have a team that's with you full-time, or um, are you doing it all on your own? So I have people that I subcontract to do certain things. Mm -hmm. A few of those are so very important. So my bookkeeper, you know, mm. she is essential to the whole thing. I just don't even want to know <laughs> about yeah. the bookkeeping, um, you know, and the accountant. So that's all handled. I have a cleaner as well. And that yes. actually frees me to not have to worry about, you know, so much cleaning. And my studio here is next to my mm -hmm. house. Uh, right. it's, it's basically, it's, it's disconnected. It's like commercial studio, but it's next to my house. And I really separate myself from yeah. the house during the day. And I'm, I work, you know, normal business hours, I suppose, you know, the nine to five sort of thing. And I'm, I'm over here. I, I've sort of thought about, would I hire someone, have them working with me? And I kind of just don't like that idea. I, I really like my flexibility and my freedom to just go and do whatever I want to do at any particular given time. So, um, yeah. I completely yeah. understand. 
Well, Karen, I want to be respectful with your time. I do like to end the show with a series of lightning round questions. These questions could have a very short answer. You can skip or you can start a whole new conversation. We could talk about it for as long as you want. So <laughs> there's really no right or wrong way of doing it. Does that mm -hmm. sound like a good plan? Yeah, this is the scary bit. Oh, wait, but I guess that's my first question. Why is that scary? Uh, different to all the stuff that I'm thinking about and passionate about right now. You, you, mm -hmm. I know I've heard some of the questions. I have to think back. So, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe there are different questions. We'll see. We'll see. My first question is, why is it important to you to make a difference as a photographer? Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. I like that one. It's important to me to, to make a difference because, I mean, what else is there, you know, just in life in general, we're in this world for a very short time um, and we can be working all in our own little bubble in our own little space. But if I can inspire other people to make a difference, then I feel I've made a difference. So it, you, it's, it, for me, that's just the reason is because it's one of the most important things. Great answer, 100%. What would you like to be remembered for? Ah, for making a difference in other creatives' lives. So specifically, exactly what I just said. Um, if I'm remembered for, well, that, that person remembers that I inspired them to go out and do something that they then were able to make a difference in, then that is the most amazing thing. What is the most difficult part about being Karen Alsop? <laughs> The juggle, I think it's the juggle always. And probably, you know, as as I said, I've got kids um, who are young and it's, yeah. it's that, oh, I, I feel like, you know, they actually underappreciate the good life that they have and the fact that I am around <laughs> oh, a lot. I'm sure. I am sure. <laughs> but they still, you know, if I have to go away and travel or especially during Christmas wish time, it's that, you know, the, it's, it's hard. It's hard being a mum and making sure that your kids, um, yeah. That's, that's Are your one. kids showing any interest in the creative arts, you know, whether it's photography, drawing, music, anything like that? Yeah, well, my daughter's really into performing and dance, uh, singing and acting, and um, both of them are quite creative. But I think they both kind of avoiding what I do deliberately, in a way, because I'm doing it. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that later on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, side story at Adobe Max. Uh, this last one, twenty what what year was that? Twenty twenty two. The the latest one. I attended a session with a video editor, and her job was to edit movie trailers. Her father is John Knoll, who created Photoshop. <laughs> so she decided not to do photography or anything to do with Photoshop. Yep. She instead did video editing. So yep. I imagine it's something like yeah, that well, with your children. Like My son actually started a YouTube channel. So he's more oh, following you your footsteps. But yeah, his YouTube <laughs> channel is, um, yeah, he gets, he gets, he's got all the good gear. <laughs> what does she show on his YouTube channel? What kind of videos uh, he, does he he's make? He's mixed it up a bit. It sort of started as, you know, the Minecraft Roblox sort of thing. But then he's done some interviews. My brother's actually a film director and um, he did an interview with him. And yeah, he's just... Uh, Nice. Films. He, he's got the he's got the Nikon gear. He's got the good computer. He's got he's got the editing desk and the stream deck and all of that. Yeah. Um. So he's got it set. Yeah. Like you said, <laughs> these kids have it good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite city in the world besides the one you live in, and why? Well, yes. <laughs> I I I feel like I really enjoyed traveling before COVID hit. Like I, I was enjoying getting out and visiting all the different places, and yeah, I love London. And but I kind of have been enjoying home so much lately that I'm, I haven't got that desire to travel. But I must say, one of my favorite places was um, New Zealand, and. I don't think I've actually been to the place that I would enjoy the most yet. Um, so I'd like to get to Queenstown and I haven't been there yet. So we'll see. Interesting because uh, Colin Smith from Photoshop Cafe, who is from New Zealand, he said his favorite place was Australia. You are an Australian. You're saying that your favorite place is New Zealand. And from at least Colin's opinion, there seems to be some sort of uh, <laughs> passion between which place is better. But it's interesting to say that you guys each other gave compliments to the to your rivals if you will 
Yeah, yeah. Although I did notice that both you and Colin said Sydney rather than Melbourne, so. Oh, well, okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> that is a very good point. I don't know if he's been to Melbourne. He didn't, he didn't specify. <laughs> When was the last time you felt proud of yourself? I knew you were going to ask this question. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I do have a particular instance that I can't always come back to. Um, you know, when I was growing up, as I said, my grandfather got me into photography and um, one of the very first magazines that I started with, I think when it just started out, was called Better Photography, an Australian magazine. Um, that was created by Peter Eastway, who's a magnificent landscape photographer. And so this magazine I collected, I, I think I, I purchased most of them growing up and as I went, got into my 20s. So down the track later on, once I started this whole journey of um, photographic art and entering competitions, I ended up winning a spot on a particular thing called the Kenson Weekend Away. And Peter Eastway was one of the um, lead Canson Infinity Ambassadors at the time, and I had the opportunity to meet him there, and that was incredible. But from that, too, I got a front cover on the Better Photography magazine. Wow. Um, my, my piece of my daughter and her dog in a plane got to be front cover on this magazine. And I've been told I've by that. Peter that, you know, it's it's not very often that these covers kind of go out to other people. So that was huge for me, like to yeah. then be on the on the cover of this particular magazine, which I've since had another cover and and various articles and and things in. So, yeah, that was. Does it ever get? Amazing. I don't want to use the word old, but do you ever get used to it? Like, oh, there I am in the front of a cover of, mag of a magazine again, or my work. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you have to get a little bit used to stuff that you see yeah. happening. It, do it doesn't yeah. have the same excitement as the first right. time. Yeah, sure, a hundred percent. The next question is, is there a book that you gifted people often? And if so, what book is that? Oh, I, I don't know. There, there is a particular book that I give to people quite often, but there is one that I just bought um, okay. that I highly recommend that I probably Ooh. would want to give to people. Yes. I Now, I don't know if you've heard of Roan. He is an incredible no. artist sort of an installation artist as well as a graffiti artist. He's Australian-based. How do you spell his name? Around the world. R-O-N-E, Roan. Okay, um, Roan. And I just went to his exhibition at Flinders Street Station. He's basically taken over the top part of this iconic station that's been closed for 30-something years. And he has put installations in each of the rooms, um, taking people back in time. There's amazing... Um, library of books and he's actually had them constructed but then his uh, graffiti art um, work of his wow. muse is integrated into it so the book about um, that and how he has been able to make that happen like it's not just for me that inspiration is yes it's incredible work but someone goes to a particular person like um, you know the mayor of, of Melbourne and the different people that they need to talk to to request something that is so hard to get, that has so much red tape and is able mm -hmm. to see that through. And he calls it his white whale. But to see that actually happen is very mm -hmm. inspirational. Yeah. That's amazing. I got to check it out. I yeah. actually just bought, and I, I don't even remember what they are anymore, but I bought three books on Kindle yesterday and I bought two audiobooks because I'm always trying to learn and consume as much as I can. I wish I had more hours in the day just to... Yeah learn as much as possible. I like to buy books on all kinds of things, whether it's psychology, language, art, design. I mean, I'm, I'm, I consume a lot of books and content. I feel that as a kid, I didn't read anything. So I'm trying to make up for it now that I'm <laughs> in my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question I have for you is, do you have a favorite quote that motivates you? And if so, what quote is that? And why does it motivate you? Well, I have a, I have a quote that is my quote that I put Ooh. on all my t-shirts and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's my catchphrase and it's imagine the impossible. I That's love it. I know what I, yeah, live by. <laughs> I love it. 
I love it. You're the second guest that quotes themselves. Mark Heaps was the first. You're the second. I like your quote better. Don't tell Mark Heaps I said that. <laughs> it's a fantastic quote. And you said you put it on, on shirts. Are those shirts for sale or are those just your, your shirts for your own private? Well, I, so I, I kind of got into the whole um, creating my own merchandise through COVID mm-hmm. as well. I bought their dye okay. sublimation and their cricket and everything. Um, so I haven't sold those yet, but I do have, I'm going to have to lift up my foot. I have shoes. Oh wow! Then by art on me. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and they are available in my gallery shop thing online. Where can people find you online? Where's your shop? Where's your website? What links should people check out if they want to learn more about you and all the amazing work that you do? Well, the best place to go is just storyart.com because that has links to absolutely everything from it. So from there, you can find the education site and the gallery site and the Behan site and uh, everything that you need to know. So storyart.com. And then look me up on Facebook and Instagram as well. Make sure you follow Karen everywhere you can. Her links will be on the show notes. There's going to be a link to it. I'm sure somewhere down below in the description, whether on YouTube or wherever you're watching or listening to this, look down below. You'll be able to click over to Karen's website and all her other social media links. Karen, my friend, thank you so much for joining me today on Today's Creator. Thank you so much for having me, Jesus. It was amazing. Love to chat with you. Thank you.